five, four, three, two, one. Hello and welcome to live stream with Megan Murphy and Kay Yang, who are actively activisting all across the Northern Hemisphere, uh, or maybe just North America. Where are you guys concentrating your activity? Two turfs taking on the world. Yay. <laughs> What are you finding? Turfsy night. Turfsy night. Is it a turfsy? It's a Wednesday. Turfsy night. Okay. I saw a tweet the other day, and I can't remember who tweeted it, and I can't remember what the tweet said, but <laughs> what I took was that, oh, I do remember. It was Tristan Hopper who writes for the National Post in Canada, and he was saying something about like Muslims and radical feminists sharing common interests, which he sort of never thought he'd see. And I was like, exactly. The real populist movement is the turf movement. The turfs have united everyone across the board, except for the retarded left. Okay. Is that, is that where you're calling your political? Enemies? I was debating whether you say retarded or not. And so I just decided to go for it. Okay. That's fine. I think it's making a comeback anyways. Um, <laughs> I'm actually world, still getting used to calling myself a turf. I don't call myself a turf, really. Like, I don't identify as a turf <laughs> or anything, really. But um, it gets applied to me so much. It's like, you know, for uh, purposes of making sense to other people, yeah. it does sort of make sense. Um, if, I sort of just find it funny now, I guess. Yeah, it's like a joke to me. Yeah, yeah. Like, I don't think, I don't take it seriously because it doesn't make any sense, but I just, so now I've decided to embrace it in sort of a humorous way, I suppose. Yes, in a humorous way. <laughs> well, Megan, you've always been comfortable with the, her, the term radical feminist. No, that's no. not true. Okay. Well, in, in a vacuum, what would you call yourself? Would you just be Megan? I've Murphy? never called myself a radical feminist. No? Nope. I'm Other people sure. call me a radical feminist. Okay. No, what I've said always is that I I used to say like my feminism was rooted in radical feminism, but okay. I never specifically identified as a radical feminist because I just didn't feel it fit. And now it sort of makes more sense to me in terms of why it didn't fit. Like I just don't like the label thing at all. Yeah. Okay. Um, and when you start calling yourself a radical feminist, then you start getting policed in terms of your behavior and your politics, and I'm not interested. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I've also found that people that don't understand anything about radical feminism or feminism, they think that the radical feminist, like when they use that term, they actually mean the TRA is the trans rights activist. They mean those people. So confusion, there's a lot of confusion. Uh, yeah, like I, they think extremist. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you, neither of you are extremists. Well, I might be, depending on who, what you think is extreme. <laughs> 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 but were you both at the one million march for kids, or I can't remember the exact hashtag. Just me. That was so. That was across Canada, and yeah. I'm currently in Canada. I'm currently uh, at my sister's house, actually, okay. um, in Canada. It's cold. And do you want me to talk about these marches at all, or was that just... I would love to. But you. Call. But before that, I, I saw a bunch of pictures of you and Kay uh, out and about, standing on rooftops, <laughs> it looked like, or on bridges. Um, so what was that about? And then you had a bunch of people say, fuck your hate or something like that. It was really this marvelous kind of show of force against you guys, or at least. Yeah, it was pretty bad. What was that about? Hey, can you explain or do. Uh, so uh, both, both Megan and I were in San Francisco um, as invited speakers for the women's declaration international um, conference that they were having. That is a radical feminist conference. Um, and, you know, even though I don't necessarily identify with the labels, I definitely have some, um, a lot of analysis that is radical. Well, it would be labeled radical feminist analysis, work with people who are radical feminists. Um, and we were both in town for that conference. Um, it was the 
I guess the second day of the conference. It was a three day conference. We were the yeah, second so day it was on the Saturday. Mm -hmm. On Saturday, we had known ahead of time that they were going to be protesting because uh, they had, you know, some articles had come out where they were talking about. They had like pictures of Kara Dansky and Lear Keith, and they were calling them, you know, fascists and this and that, and saying that they were going to oppose them. So it, we knew that there was going to be some opposition at the hotel. Um, but I think they said they were going to be there at two o'clock to start protesting us. And they actually kind of started showing up around 11, I think it was. Oh, um, early risers. Early risers. So that is kind of early for them. Um, they didn't have anything to do that Friday night, which isn't surprising, to be honest, <laughs> by the looks of them. Oh, no. <laughs> Uh, let's see. So we were in the financial district of San Francisco, which is like supposedly, I, that's the first time I've ever been there. It's supposedly one of the better places that you could be. It's kind of turning into a crazy lawless city with a lot of like drug addicts and break-ins and stuff like that going on. So we were in part of the town that was supposed to be like better, um, pretty much right at the base of Chinatown. So the Chinatown in San Francisco, it's like, it's the oldest one in the U.S. I think it's the biggest one. It's pretty huge. Um, but our hotel is, was opposite of the big, like, main park in Chinatown. So um, actually what you all saw us on that people were saying was a rooftop, it's a bridge that connects from the Hilton Hotel to the park in Chinatown. Because um, I think like the hotel, when they moved in, their like big mega hotel at the base of Chinatown, they gave like a gift to the community of like a cultural heritage center. And that's what connects um, to Chinatown. So anyways, um, that's sort of like the background of what we were doing there and the setup. Do you, I don't know if you want to say anything more, Megan, before I continue. Yeah. So, so yeah. So I was asked to attend this conference, the Women's Declaration International Comment Conference, to speak on a panel actually about feminists working with the right. Um, huh. So, I, you know, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a conference that was specifically addressing transgenderism. It was a conference to discuss the women's liberation movement mm -hmm. at large. Um, and yeah, so, the protesters blocked off the entire intersection right next to the hotel. I don't know how or why they were permitted to do that. Um, there were cops there to protect the hotel. Um, and the protesters started to get um, aggressive. And uh, one of them, I believe, took a hammer to the Hilton Hotel sign. Um, one of them punched the hotel GM in the head. Uh, that guy Why? was arrested. They, you know, they were chanting. I, I mean, they just started to get rowdy and started to, I mean, these are Antifa people. And I think one of their tactics is to destroy property and to vandalize. Right. Okay. This is my yeah, impression. And ahead, of the, ahead of the conference, they were actually like trying to get people in the community together to call the hotel and cancel, like basically say that we could not be there anymore for our event and to uh, basically just stop us from having the conference. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Like, and we were, so we were just using one of the ballrooms in the hotel that was rented by the conference organizers to host the panels. It was a private space. No one was allowed to access that floor um, unless they were part of the convention. So attached to that floor was this bridge that Kay mentioned earlier. Um, so this was a secure area, or it should have been a secure area in any case. It was gated off, the gate was locked, um, and the only other entrance were these doors to access the floor in the ballroom where the convention was being held. So Kay and I were out there watching the protesters from above and filming and taking photos. Um, they at some point saw us up there and started yelling at us. Um, one of them, you know, some of them I remember were started chanting, fuck Megan Murphy. So they recognized oh. me. Um, and Even what else were they saying? Going on. Huh? You didn't have your signature hair going on, but they did still recognize you. <laughs> they figured it out. The redheaded pale turf. She had, her, she had flat hair that day, but they still figured it out because they're so hard <laughs> My disguise. Huh. Um, and they were chanting, what else were they chanting? 
Do you remember? They were calling us Nazis. Um, they were calling us bigots. They were yeah. telling us to go home. Um, Come out yeah. of your hidey hole. They were making fun of us for being scared of them, despite the fact that they were threatening us. Also, despite the fact that I was actually out there face to face with them prior to that, down on the street before mm. I got, before they got into like a huge mass of people and they had kind of started gathering and a few women were out there um, just kind of laughing at them and taking pictures. And I went out there as well. I had one of my signs with me. I just wanted to, you know, kind of show them that you're not going to just come out here and try to harass and intimidate us without any opposition or pushback whatsoever. So I did take my sign out there and they predictably acted the way that they always do, shoving, touching, saying, that, oh, I'm not touching you. They love to do that. Like, a, like literally like a little kid would do, I'm not touching you, I'm not touching you. But of course they were, you know, the, the masks, the umbrellas, their signature umbrellas, they like to shove you with. Um, and there were like a few police there at that time. And they, I was like, you know, what are you guys doing? Are you going to stop any of this? No, they were more concerned about making sure that I was moved. Me and the other women were away from them, as, but their whole thing was like policing us. Like we were the ones causing the problem, despite the fact that we weren't yelling at anybody. We weren't calling any names. We were just like standing there peacefully. So the cops were like super concerned about us. When I asked them if they were gonna do anything to stop these people, they were like, well, our, um, if you wanna be safe, then we need you to move. So, yeah. you know, they're, they're not protecting us. Um, well, like it makes sense that you would probably be the more docile them. ones, the ones that would be easier to control for the police. Certainly, yeah. I mean, the Antifa guys are always violent and aggressive. I'm sure that mm -hmm. those cops are used to dealing with those folks by now. I did not go down to interact with the protesters because I'm terrified of them. Uh, Kay is braver than I am. I stay as far as I can away from those people because they're violent and volatile and mentally unstable. And um, yeah, so we were up there taking photos and filming, and then all of a sudden, one of the guys that we were with uh, yelled at us, they're coming, run. <laughs> and we turned around, and this gang of about eight men, masked men, um, were running towards us, and one woman um, were running towards us, and um, it was terrifying. <laughs> I've never had to run away from a gang of men before in my entire life. Okay. And I was very glad that I was wearing comfortable shoes and that I had been doing so many deadlifts over the past two years because <laughs> I had to take the stairs two by two. And it was fucking terrifying. Like, I, I just, they were running, they were up there running after us to attack us. And surely if this man that we were with hadn't told us, we would have been attacked. You know, we did narrowly escape. They would have caught us for sure. I did not hear them coming. And we learned afterwards from the security guys that they had... Uh, they had um, scaled the, the gate. There was like these big, huge doors at the end of the bridge that were locked closed. So they had climbed over to get into this bridge that was private property and attached to the hotel to attack us. Are, are they just getting their weekend exercise? Like what is their purpose there? What are they trying to accomplish? To murder it, us, I think. Okay. Yeah. For what? Why, why are you such a threat? I think they enjoy intimidating and harassing and abusing women. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Honestly, these are guys. These are not like, I don't believe that there's such a thing as a trans person, but um, you know, they're not, they're not men who are identifying as transgender. They're just regular pale, skinny, violent yeah. men who want to hunt down and attack women. Like you have to, they don't go after men. They were going after us. Mm -hmm. They did. They did attack the guy because he went for them. So we ran away, and he ran towards them to try to like stall them. And they like went after him. They weren't mm -hmm. able to get very far. Um, mm -hmm. They threw a bottle at him. He ducked. They tried to punch him. He ducked. Um, they were grabbing at his jacket and trying to throw him around and things like that. Um, I think they're thugs. I think that they probably believe, or at least they say that they're you know, trying to stop hate, 
and to stop bigotry and white supremacists and Nazis, of course, you know, they're anti-fascists, right? Mm -hmm. um, and as people who protect women's rights and women's spaces, they believe us to be bigoted towards trans identified people. But I don't know that they really care about that issue. I don't mm -hmm. really buy that they're impassioned about something called trans rights. Mm. What, what were the women trying to declare? It was a women's declaration international. What was the declaration in the end? Um, well, do you want to explain? Or I... Go ahead. Um, I mean, the women's declaration international is an international uh, organization. So there's different chapters across the world. Um, I think it was started in the U.S., but there's one in Canada, and they're all over the place. Like, I think yeah. there's probably one in, like, New Zealand and Australia. Um, and it's a declaration to protect women's sex-based rights. Okay. Mm -hmm. and so it wasn't specific to this convention. It's a pre-existing organization. Okay. So the organization is called Women's Declaration International. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, how about how old is it? Like how, how long has it been? Is it fairly recent or? I would say a few years at okay. least. Is it in response to the uh, specific erosion of women's sex-based rights uh, that's derived from tra transgender ideology? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you can go to Women Declaration International to read the whole declaration that um, a lot of different like women who are who know the law have like laid it all out. Um, it's okay. basically just a plan to try to protect women's sex based rights. And also, it's really about getting women around the world to understand that this is going on and affecting them because this isn't just something that's happening in the West is this is a global project. Hmm. Um, and there were women from all over the world at the conference with us. So it wasn't just American women being terrorized. This was a message for women of the whole world to know that mm. if you dare to speak up on this issue, uh, we're coming. Because also they are not just organized across the U.S., loosely organized. They're organized across the world, right? The, these people who are organizing to oppose us and shut down our free speech, so this was a message I think they wanted to send to harass, threaten, and intimidate women. And I think, you know, they want us to shut the F up. They don't want us to speak because every time we speak, we're poking holes through their BS, right? Like we're proving that, that they're full of shit, <laughs> that their ideology is ridiculous. And they don't want that. They, I think they know that they're standing on a house of cards. Huh. Of course. I mean, I think that if they had defensible arguments, they wouldn't need to stop our speech at any cost um, mm -hmm. and to lie about us constantly. The only things that they ever say about us, the women who are protecting sex-based rights, are lies. Um, you know, that we're well, trying to exterminate people or erase yeah. the existence of people, um, that we hate so-called trans kids, um, that we, you know, support, I guess, gender conformity, which is complete bullshit. I think, I mean, they're very, they're really organized. Like they, you'd be surprised at how organized these people are. And they have so much power is incredible. The fact that they were able to just shut off this ma major intersection in San Francisco, in the financial district mm -hmm. for the entire day into the evening and terrorize uh, this hotel, the Hilton, and terrorize these security guys, terrorize the GM, the staff, and the cops didn't shut this down is crazy. Mm -hmm. but th and this is consistent across the board. You know, mm -hmm. like I was at this 1 million March for Children in Victoria uh, last weekend. Um, so San Francisco was the weekend before last, and then I came yeah. to Canada. And the protesters, the counter protesters to our peaceful rally, which was meant to have about six speakers and music and then a march, again, all peaceful, families, kids, elder women, um, like the, the counter protests were permitted to take over the entire space. The cops had committed to, to the security team. Um, committed to keeping the protesters away from the people attending the rally, ensuring there would be no physical contact between the protesters and the people attending the rally. And they did not even attempt 
to keep the protesters at bay. They had cordoned off an area specifically for the people attending the rally. The protesters waltzed right in. The cops did nothing. And they just all came and stormed the front and then started throwing themselves at the stage, trying to attack the speakers. One speaker, uh, Serena, um, who was also the MC, so she had spoken. I was next. I got halfway through my talk and the cops cut the mic and said, you have to stop the entire rally. No march. We're shutting everything down. It's too dangerous, too violent. But they let it get to that point. They did yeah, exactly. nothing nothing mm -hmm. to stop these people from coming and i'm positive that these cops knew exactly what was going to happen of course Where was this again victoria at the legislature okay. Oh, okay i mean and then uh your prime minister justin trudeau um comes <laughs> out saying that we denounce hate of, right of the, all the wi-fi password people um, <laughs> so so everybody, everybody from the street the thugs, yeah, well, the, the street thugs and your prime minister are saying the same thing. Mm -hmm. We need to stop hate at any price. Mm -hmm. So. Right. I mean, and all of these groups are funded by the government in Canada. Mm -hmm. The anti-hate ne network. Yeah. All of these counter protester groups, the counter protests were organized in large part by the union reps. Mm -hmm. what, yeah, union, right? what kind of union? Um, okay. So CUPE, one of our biggest union that represents government employees, uh, the teachers union, um, you know, there was a leaked a meeting of union reps who may have seen before these events took place, uh, suggesting that people show up and, you know, keep track of if there are any union members there and keep track their license plate numbers and cars so that they know that they aren't getting away with this and that they're being seen. Getting you know, away with what? Imagine being a union member and you're, this is what your union reps are saying because you want to come out to this rally and, you know, maybe you're, you want to oppose kids being taught gender identity ideology in school. Maybe you're just curious to learn more about what's going on. <laughs> it's creepy, <laughs> man. And, and it's just the, the, the fact that these people claim to be under threat and marginalized is hilarious. Mm -hmm. when they have the entire government and almost every single political party and all the unions and the cops and academia and every single institution on their side protecting them. Mm -hmm. And the media, was there a media blackout about this uh, march? There was media coverage and it was very they biased. Probably found, and they probably found this one lonely swastika. Well, there, they couldn't find a swastika at our event. Hmm. <laughs> Alas for them. Um, but they, you know, like I watched the local news, Czech news, which is like the I Vancouver Island news and the reporter, you know, was like, I don't even think these people know what they're protesting. I don't even think they know what Soji is just these, like these far right extremists, blah, 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 blah. That was most of the coverage, far right extremists um who yeah. hate you know lgbtq sai plus plus whatever people um i mean nobody interviewed me i don't think anybody interviewed any of the organizers yeah. <laughs> they did they did interview counter protesters and i saw an article in you know another local paper saying that like love stopped hate and it's like you tried to physically attack us and were uh, physically aggressive with mothers and kids and elder women and hurled hate at us until we were forced to leave. And then you publish an article claiming that you were the love people and we're the hate people. Hmm. It's sick. Yeah, the media was super biased on it. Oops. You know, Kay Yang, um, Megan just said the, the acronym SOGI, which is sexual orientation and gender yeah. identity. And that's being taught in schools. And I know that your expertise is, uh, or at least your past was in teaching and mm -hmm. doing outreach and teaching for this stuff. So you were kind of like, and our first interview is, is on my channel. It's wonderful. Yes. Um, could you talk a little bit more and expand upon what this SOGI thing is? And so far as you know what it is yeah. and why somebody would be wary of it, why parents might want to not want their kids exposed to it yeah so i used to work at an lgbt nonprofit. i was an education and outreach programmer and coordinator 
Um, I started working there back in 2011. And actually, 2011 is the first year that the United Nations issued their first report on SOGI, which again is sexual orientation and gender identity. This is when they started to introduce the language of gender identity into um, UN documents and from there try to push it down um, on a federal level within the U.S. government and also push it on a national level in all the governments that the U.N. works with. Um, so this introduction of this term basically is when they started to really first destabilize the, um, the measurable category of sex and start inserting gender identity wherever sex um, and gender would have been in place before. So as soon as you introduce this concept of gender identity, you're making it impossible to make clear distinctions under the law um, in medical settings and educational settings between males and females. Because what it means is that basically any female uh, can identify as a male and a male can identify as a female. So then it doesn't, none of it means anything anymore, which is the Wait, purpose. But but uh, so sexual orientation is then made nonsensical by gender identity, right? So you, yes, you can't have sexual orientation yeah. and yeah, right? Right, which is part of the like manipulation and uh, like little like word magic that they're doing here by attaching the two together. They make you think that these two things go together, but they're in direct conflict and opposition to one another. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it's, yeah. And one of the things that I find really scary, which is I was trying to include in my talk that got cut short, is that, you know, it's really hard to teach girls healthy boundaries. Um, I think that women in general are taught that their boundaries are mean. Um, And, you know, women are sort of socialized or you might say more inclined towards uh, getting along um and not rocking the boat and not you know pissing people off and you know it's kids are just learning you know they don't have their spidey senses intact yet um or they might not know to trust their gut feeling you know a kid might well be like this adult is acting weird or inappropriate but they might not know why And now they have adults teaching them that those feelings are bigoted and wrong, right? So there's a grown man in the change room at the pool. Um, You can't say anything. That man's actually a woman. You're wrong that that man is a man. You're wrong that it's wrong for him to be in that space. You're wrong to feel creeped out by that person. And you definitely can't say anything about it. Mm -hmm. It's dangerous. And we know that these instances that like what Megan just talked about, we're not just making this up. These are not hypotheticals. Exactly what she just mentioned is what we know happened um, in Port Townsend, Washington, where um, Amy Souza had the Let Julie Swim campaign, where her friend um, Julie, who you interviewed, actually, Ben, they were both on your show before. Um, But we know that this 80 year old woman, Julie, was at the YMCA and Uh, There was a man addressing the straps of a little girl's bathing suit. And she turned around and said, hey, you can't be in here. And they immediately banned her for life from the YMCA. So according to places like the YMCA, and this isn't the first incident with the YMCA. They've done a lot of this and the YWCA. um, These institutions that are supposed to be places for children, for families to utilize as resources, even in the YMCA, YWCA, those are supposed to be places where you can go if you're experiencing domestic violence or abuse, if you're low income, if you're a mom who, um, a single mom who's at the end of your means and you are supposed to be able to access these safe spaces to get resources. Um, and now, you know, now these spaces are being carved out to enforce um to enforce like naked male genitalia on children i mean that that's essentially what they're doing yeah even so in nanaimo we're holding a a panel event it's a a women a women's panel but the event is not women only it's for uh, the public um in nanaimo and one of the women who is on our panel is named janea wright and she was at the Nanaimo Community Center, the community pool, 
and a man was in the change room and her daughter was in there changing. And according to Jenea, this man was looking under the bathroom stalls, uh, under the doors. Uh, she told him to leave and he wouldn't leave. She f- escorted him out, like physically walked him out the change room, told the staff, and they told her that it was his human right to be there because, you know, he identifies as a trans or a woman or whatever. Um, and the city told her the same. He, it's my human right to my human right to, to be rapey in the bathroom. Mm-hmm. Be yeah. You don't want to discriminate against the rapists. Right. They have human rights too. Yeah, it's discriminatory. As long as they're trans, as long as they say they're trans, because trans rights are human rights. And where does that line come from? That line comes directly from the United Nations. They made that up. And that's what these activists scream and yell and cry about saying that they're oppressed and that we are the fascists. Meanwhile, they're chanting political propaganda and slogans from the United Nations. Yeah, like hypocritical. We've created the perfect yeah. loophole for predators. Yeah. So, like anybody yeah. can say that. Any single man in the there's no. This is why I say like there's no such thing as a trans person. There's no such thing as a trans woman. There are men who claim to be women or men who claim to be transgender. It doesn't matter. Any man can say that. And what's mm-hmm. the difference between a man who just is a man and then tomorrow says he's a trans woman? There's no difference. Nothing's changed. It's, it's just a complete fiction mm-hmm. that people have created, turned into legislation and are now, you know, fighting women about as if they're, you know, fighting the good fight. They're fighting mm-hmm. for predators. That's what they're doing. They're fighting for predator rights. So, Kate, uh, when did you start to speak out about this issue? Um, Well, I started speaking out anonymously at first, starting back in like 2017. I was just an avatar on the internet. Um, I had a couple of accounts that got like some traction and then got um, banned. And then I started doing the deprogrammer videos on YouTube in like 2018, was still anonymous at that time. Um, And then in 2021 is when I sort of was like, okay, I need, I can't just be doing online stuff. I need to get out there in the real world as well. And that's when I sort of pivoted to doing on the ground activism, but I still was sort of in the background um, because I am a longtime organizer and activist. So I have a lot of experience and I have a lot of experience organizing across different political lines, racial lines, backgrounds, bringing people together. So I was sort of in the background for the Women Picket DC event that happened in 2021. And that's when women uh, organized from across the country to go to Washington DC to take a stand against Biden's executive order on gender identity, which he signed like the first day um, of the administration. And that is when gender identity started to get introduced here on a federal level. It, um, It was like a mandate that they issued. And actually the mandate, it was similar to the, the COVID mandates that work the same kind of way. You have to consent to um, a mandate, right? That's how a mandate works. You must consent to it. That's when it becomes into effect. So if you we must didn't consent. consent, so there's no well, way to not consent to consent. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, that's the, another rapey kind of thing. It sounds like to me. <laughs> the contract. Mandatory begins, consent. Once you start agreeing, that's when your consent is given. That's when the contract begins, Mm -hmm. once you start to agree. So, you know, people didn't have to go along with it, but because there is pressure coming uh, and there's there's all kinds of financial pressure, but there's also like all this vast network of basically blackmail that goes on with these in the nonprofit world, right? If you don't yeah. meet this, this, and that requirement, if you aren't pushing die diversity, inclusion, and equity, if you're not pushing this in your organization, then you are not eligible for funding, right? You're not eligible to keep your operations going because you are not doing what you're supposed to do to meet the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which all yeah. of these organizations are beholden to. Well, what's so sustainable about gender identity? Identity, other than the fact that I assume it decreases human uh, population by uh, dent of the fact that it's castrating so many people and sterilizing mm-hmm. people. Like, what's sustainable? How does this tie into sustainability from your point of view? 
Well, they call it sustainability, but that's just like kind of a code word, right? This isn't about, it's not about sustainability. This is about social control. This is about population control. And population control means woman control because it's women that give birth to all the population, right? Every, all the population is born out of women's bodies. So control women's bodies, control what we can do, how we can do, where we can go, when we can do it, um, what we can call ourselves, um, what others call Women us. Women the spigot. Yes. So control us, control the population. And that's what they're interested in. And they're also interested uh, it, within population control. They want to reduce the population and control the amount of people being born. So the UN actually has a policy of um, zero growth. So their ideal is that there are no, we don't grow any more whatsoever in population because it's so unsustainable. Okay. <laughs> and gender identity and um, to a certain extent, um, non-procreative uh, sexual identities or sexual orientations uh, fall in line with that. So it makes sense that they would support one and then use that sexual orientation to smuggle in the gender identity, which can then like act as a kind of like a sterilization bomb on the so-called cis population or the heteronormative mm -hmm. population. Right. So yeah, that's part I, of it. I asked, I asked about your, uh, your background. Cause that, Megan, you've been working on this for a while or involved in this in a while. Um, I'm wondering like one of the big things that I'm curious about is, is coalition building and reaching across differences. And you're both doing that. Megan, you said that your talk was specifically about a woman talking to the right wing. And I'm just wondering how, like, like the interesting, you know, meeting grounds of people with different ideologies, maybe more conservative people working with more liberal people. Um, and what, what are the interesting kind of like connections that you guys are making? And if there is kind of a map for coalition building that you guys are witnessing on the front lines with this issue, um, I mean, I think that the idea that the world is divided up into left and right is a lie and it's mm. a lie to ensure that we can't get anywhere and that we can't have any power as the people and the people do have the power and the government knows that, you know, they know that. Mm we all get together and fight back, we'll win and they'll lose. And we mm -hmm. saw that happen through the truckers convoy. Um, and the truckers convoy, you know, it was not made up of any, you know, this was not a, a, a partisan uh, group. It was just normies. It was regular working class people. It was families. It was Christians. It was Muslims. Um, no, it, it was, was white supremacists. <laughs> It was the Nazis, Misogynist. according to the propaganda, according to the, the hundreds of thousands, the millions of Nazis populating Canada. We've all heard of that group. Mm -hmm. Like, I've never heard of a single Nazi in Canada. But, well, uh, what are you talking about? <laughs> Didn't your government just salute one, like have a standing ovation? Ah, they found weekend? one. You're they right. found the one the Nazi. The liberal government they... knows the one Nazi in Canada and they <laughs> plotted him. <laughs> Uh, yeah, like I just, I mean, it's just, it's such a diverse group of people and it's been, it's been interesting for me as somebody who, you know, grew up and spent most of their life identifying as a leftist and, um, believing Embedded in that, a leftist culture, at least a very liberal oh, culture yeah. in Vancouver, yeah. Blindly committed to, to socialism, to the left just i i didn't even know any right-wing people i didn't know any religious people um i thought they were stupid or evil you know i thought exactly what these progressives think about us and they don't know that i'm like on to them because i'm like yeah i understand what you think because you're ignorant like i was and i didn't think i was ignorant it's not like i was stupid you know i don't think i've ever been a stupid person um, but I was just not, you know, I wasn't exposed to different points of views and I had been taught that those points of views were so wrong that they weren't worth considering and that those of us who were on the left were better than the people who weren't on the left, you know, that we were the ones who cared yeah. about, uh, humanity, we cared about equality, of course, whatever the fuck that means, nothing. Um, we cared about, you know, I, I, and to be fair, I did, you know, I didn't want people to be poor. And I thought, you know, why do people have to be poor? And I didn't, I wanted 
all violence to end, which is ridiculous and impossible. Um, hmm. But you know, Somebody I've always been. Pilled. Can... Sounds like he got pilled at some point. I don't know. I don't want to say which. I think kind of so. Pill you yeah, took. he got a pill though. I guess maybe the red one. Copper <laughs> Yeah, totally orange filled. Um, I I've lost where I was going with this, but I mean, I, I oh this but group. You yeah, have I to mean, come so over, the same you have things to, you've happen had to overcome within resistance within your feminist uh, circles to so-called right wing. Oh yeah, I mean, know, they all canceled me too. The feminists yeah. of Canada, you know, the feminists that I was aligned with and working with in Canada, most of them, you know, it's so interesting because while on one hand they can they can see that the transgender issue is harmful and wrong, they see it through a very narrow narrow lens, which is fair because this issue primarily is about women and women's rights and it does primarily affect women. It doesn't really harm men in the same way that it harms women. Um, but it's more than just that. It's not just about women and it's not just about women's rights. It's about more than that. And I think, you know, they it's it's disappointing because they can see that but they can't get on board with the uh with advocating for free speech and for civil liberties um because those words are tarred as Okay. You know, right so away. it's not it's not right. so simple So they have all this kind of like lining. they have sort of a woke view except for this one issue, if you okay. will. So they all tarred me as kind of a racist and I was in bed with the right. Oh. I see these women like posting things or people send me things anyway. People send me screenshots from like Facebook groups and stuff where they're yeah. saying, oh, Megan sold out for the money and the power. And I was like, man, like I lost so I don't make any money. Like, I mean, I'm surviving, but like yeah. I am not getting rich off of this work. <laughs> Most of this yeah. work I'm doing for free. Like I'm no Matt Walsh over here. And I mean, the power is a joke. I've been completely ignored and marginalized and um, tarred by the Canadian mainstream media and by all of my political representatives, yeah. including the mayor, including the premier, including the prime minister, et cetera, et cetera. And Kay Yang, one of, if I recall correctly from our interview, and again, excellent interview, because you just bring up all the goods to the table. And um, it was that you woke up part of your journey out of that activist camp that was basically just parroting the marching orders from the UN was that you realized that there were toxic dynamics in the activist community, mm-hmm. that that itself was what woke you up rather than just the ideology is how that ideology was playing out in personal mm-hmm. dynamics and how certain crimes, I think you, you did talk about there were crimes that were happening that were being covered up because uh, mm-hmm. it was, ha- it was, it was blessed. So I'm wondering, um, I mean, broadly speaking, how, how do activists, how do, how do effective dissidents to the power structures um, when the power structures are corrupt, how do they organize in a way? What, what do they need to avoid? How do they come together and, uh, you know, just let go of certain dynamics that actually work in favor of their enemy? Like what are some of the trip wires and, and both of you as organizers, how have you guys worked against that or, or kind of brush those things aside or, or taken the higher ground perhaps? in order to be effective at getting this message across and actually affecting change in legislation. I mean, you really, you have to get away from the partisanship, right? I mean, I think that there are, there were, and there remain a lot of women who still believe that we have to fight this on the left and we have to change the left and we have to get through to our leftist political parties. And that's not going to happen. Those people don't give a shit about what we have to say. They don't want to hear from us. We aren't going to change their minds. We aren't funding them. We're not voting for them anymore either. Um, you have to talk to whoever can help, you know, on whatever side of the political spectrum they are. And you organize with whoever you can organize with, provided that they're trustworthy people and they're not sketchy, mm-hmm. right? Um, yeah. And... And you'll learn a lot from that. You know, I've learned, obviously, you know, Benjamin, I've changed my mind about so many things ideologically and politically and in terms of, you know, just how people are and what, how humanity functions in society and things like that. And that's because I've talked to all sorts of different people and I've learned from them and I've opened, I've actually opened my mind, you know, the, the be open-minded, be inclusive, love is love people are the ones 
who are completely closed minded and don't want to hear from anyone who doesn't repeat exactly what they already believe and, and exactly, you know, the kinds of mantras that they support. Um, mm-hmm. And so, yeah, the, you know, expanding away from the left, away from feminism has, it's opened my mind politically, but it's also, you know, it, I think that it makes you a lot more optimistic because you realize mm-hmm. like how many good people um, and courageous people, um, people who are willing to fight there are all over the place and places you never would have encountered before you know through doing actually this this rally in victoria um the million the one million march for children that was organized by freedom people you know um the freedom movement here so i'm connected now to all these people in the freedom movement across canada and there are are so you get like one which i didn't realize how many people there were in canada who are committed to sorry no, the, the freedom movement comes from the trucker movement. So now you have like, uh-huh. you can just hitch, hitch a ride anywhere now because you're connected to the truck. <laughs> yeah. It's got to have the benefits. Back of a truck. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and what about UK? Like, like, especially in the last, I guess, couple years, because your work's kind of like uh, broadened quite a bit, especially with the mm-hmm. rise of, of what you're mm-hmm. working against. Yeah, well, it's interesting because even though, you know, I was a quote unquote leftist, I myself never identified with liberalism or like being a Democrat or anything like that whatsoever. I was actually, you know, I was on the left. I was a radical who considered liberals my enemy (laughs) in a lot of ways. Um, And uh, (laughs) it's interesting how that's evolved because now I see what a problem they really, really are. Um, Because a lot of these people, they don't really have any real beliefs they or politics to back them up. They have a lot of empty, like, stories. They, there's, like, these stories and narratives that they have been sold and that they believe in. Yeah. And UK and all, flags and uh, uh, little syringes in their users. Well, that's what it is thing. now. Yeah, that's what it is yeah. now. Um, yeah, and that's the thing. When the whole, quote, unquote, the pandemic and the lockdowns began and everything, it became so obvious that none of those people, like all my old friends and like comrades and stuff, I'm like, you do not oppose the state in any way, shape or form whatsoever. You are literally foot soldiers for the yes. state. That's yes. obvious. With the trans and, and stuff. Well. Did you see? Did you see them? Like any of them? Like recognize that 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 they were just receiving marching orders? I don't really know. I'm like really okay. curious what some of the people from yeah. my past think about some of the things that I've said um, <laughs> on yeah. TV or whatever. Because um, I do know that they've been watching what I say. I know that a lot of people have said things like, oh, it's such a shame what's happened to her. Like, oh my God, it's so sad what's happened to her. Look at her now. Whatever that's supposed to mean. Um, <laughs> you used to be so <laughs> smart and now I'm look at you so saying great. all and now these I'm things so awful. that you're not supposed to say. Boot licker. <laughs> not licking then, the boot. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And this is part of the problem with these like identitarian politics, right? Because that was something that I was part of, like trying organizing around identity. Um, I was doing, I was involved in a lot of organizing around like people of color and like we need to organize against white supremacist violence and this and that. And, you know, there are obviously this is america there are real issues of racism we have institutional racism we have this whole um a long ongoing history that history is not in a vacuum it's not devoid from things that happen today but this has been this issue around race and identity has been completely weaponized and co-opted and you and is being used now as a tool to divide the the public to divide us against one another so that we can be dominated from the top down. And that's exactly what's happening. And it's like, I see more and more how organizing around um, identity in terms of race is, it's sort of ridiculous at this point. Um, For me, especially as I've witnessed the way that the American propaganda has formulated around like Black Lives Matter and the Stop Asian Hate. Like actually when we were in San Francisco, Megan, I don't know if you remember, I was like, watch this. And then I'm like, 
stop Asian hay. I like yelled down from the, um, from the bridge that we were on. Cause they were screaming at us, threatening us, calling us Nazis. <laughs> so, and, and it's almost all white people down there, right? They're, they're all white. <laughs> put their black stuff on it. And so I started yelling, stop Asian hate. And like, I went back and watched it on my little video I took and they actually like get totally quiet and like, don't, they have like a moment where they're like, uh, uh, what do do? <laughs> like, oops, like does not compute. I don't know what to do. Um, but anyways, yeah. So I'm more, I, I do believe it's important for women to organize around our sex-based rights because that mm. actually makes sense, right? Um, sex is, mm. sex is sex. Race, on the other hand, is socially constructed. And as you move around different places in the world, even in the country, you go to different places, race is structured a little bit differently. Mm. Um, and like racism, you know. Like and racism, racism is right. totally different in different countries. You know, like exactly. these these types, different these counties. leftists think it's like white on black, and that's mm -hmm. just not true. <laughs> you know, well, like across then, um, different countries. To to kind of push the envelope a bit, um, like are there are there make it or break it issues? And I I assume that from a radical feminist perspective, like they probably it would be a very bitter pill to swallow to align with females who are pro-life, right? Like abortion issue used to be the centerpiece of women's rights. And now it's kind of in competition with um, sex-based spaces or even just sex, sex realism, right? So how, how have you guys found ways to navigate those differences? And is that a make it or break it issue, right? If you're working with somebody who wants to restrict your rights to medical care, if, if I may use that formulation or to stop you from harming unborn children, if I use another, uh, you know, formulation, like there, there's gotta be a way to give and take around that as a women's issue. So I'm so I'm wondering how, how you guys have navigated that and how much of a make it or break it deal like that issue or any other issues within the large umbrella of women's liberation or just women's rights um, is playing out under this kind of particular pressure cooker moment. Um, I mean, I know a lot of pro-life people now and I work with some pro-life people um, and I mean, I so, this is not going to be a very satisfying answer, but I think everybody's wrong <laughs> when it comes to the abortion debate. Like, the Democrats mm. are wrong, the Republicans are wrong, the left is wrong, the right's wrong. Hmm. Um, you know, I think that abortion shouldn't even be talked about as abortion, and it certainly shouldn't be legislated around. I mean, women have been um, self aborting, if you want to call that, regulating their menses since the dawn of time. It's nobody's business. It's not. Um, mm. And this debate that people are having around late-term abortions is largely a fake debate as well. You know, that's a really, really, you know, like, what if a woman is having an abortion at eight months? It's like, how many women do you know want to have abortions at eight months? Like, if a woman is wanting to end her pregnancy at eight months, something really, really, really serious has gone wrong. Um, and it's just not a common thing. Like, it's not like women are willy nilly at eight months being like, eh, I don't want a baby anymore. That's just not a common thing that's happening. Um, but I mean, I do, I think people need to take bodily autonomy seriously. You know, like if we're going to advocate for sovereign beings, for ourselves to be sovereign beings, for us to have true autonomy, to have choice over our bodies, then you have to apply that to women too. And I know that the argument would be like, that's a human being and, um, you know, we have to protect that human being too. But, you know, my view is that as long as this thing is living inside of a woman's body and relies on her body for its survival, then she has the final say in whether or not she wants to give birth. And once you start restricting that, things become draconian very is quickly. That, is that fundamentally different than the ability to uh, modify one's body to replicate a female if you're a male or to replicate a male if you're a female? I'm not trying to stop men from rep, like getting breast implants or you know okay. carving holes into their bodies that penises can go into. They can do that if they want, but they can't call themselves female because it's not true. 
Sure. If somebody wants to turn themselves into a freak, then I mean, knock yourself out, I guess. <laughs> I'd be hitting Megan Murphy. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let, let, let's hear your spicy take. Well, I also, I first want to say something about race again, because mm. yes, race does have a biological component. Cause I see there's like back and forth in the, in the chat, whatever of course race has a biological component, but racism and the way that race is structured is, is socially constructed because it is different wherever you go. It's not structured in the same way in the same places. It's just not. And also different, like the way the way that my race is seen is subject to change, depend on literally on who's looking at me and where I am physically where I am. So that's what I mean to say that there's a, so there's a constructed. I mean, and, and yeah, and, and you can go too far with that by relativizing that, but I don't think you can actually adapt to social circum situations and actually travel the world without like just understanding that you're going to be seen differently by different groups of people and mm -hmm. different groups of people, you know, like structure, their relationship to other groups of people based on looks, based on color of skin, based on, you know, family of origins, stuff like that. So like, I think I, I agree with you. I'm just trying to put a, you know, feather yeah. in that and camp. we have a lot of mixed race people, but you don't have mixed sex people. You have males or females and you have people with um, sex mm -hmm. chromosome abnormalities, right? You do not have a mixture of both <laughs> the two male and female, right? But you can be mixed multiple, two races, three races, four races. That's a thing, right? So there is, so sex is not the same as race. I know that there's a lot of um, hmm. attempts to make those things the same by, I think both people on the left and right for different reasons. So kind of getting to what um, more, what we were just talking about, Megan mentioned this earlier, like something about like left and right and how that's sort of just like a false dichotomy, right? left and right these are two sides of the same coin in my opinion both of these are sort of pushing us towards overarching agendas so in terms of when we're talking about in the us you've got this like the red republicans and the blue democrats and if you wear your red maga cap this is what you think and if you have your like rainbow hair this is what you think you know mm -hmm. um these two things are sort of working together at a at a greater level so when we had, when the lockdowns and everything was started and the mandates started, I saw a lot of um, radical feminists, gender critical people, people who call themselves like free thinkers and stuff like saying that, um, you know, that we needed to have these physical medical mandates on our bodies. These are the same people who were also saying that we have to um, secure women's right to abortion. Well, how are you going to secure women's rights to abortion or bodily autonomy if on the other hand, you're trying to force everybody into some type of, you know, um, medical mandate on their body? These two ideas don't don't go together <laughs> and the same thing you know you had people on the quote unquote right saying like hands off my body no mandates or whatever <laughs> and at the same time they're saying stop those those whores from having abortions you know <laughs> like yeah. these, there needs to be some consistency and i feel like when people get really invested in these partisan politics the consistency flies out the window because then they they start marching in lockstep with like a the certain okay. mindset so then how do you create a stable coalition between that those two camps like how have you guys seen those coalitions come together and stabilize Mm -hmm. Is it around chil I think children? You go like a higher issue value by a issue. Value? Okay, issue by issue. So with the I mean, one just... million march for children, it would be this is about children. It doesn't matter what you think about this, that, or the other thing. This is about protecting right. children from lies and bodily harm. Yeah, I mean, I don't think you can form long-term coalitions. It doesn't. It, I mean, that doesn't well, hasn't are, worked in my experience. In any yet? case, like so. I think you. No, I'm not getting engaged. Okay. I'm not forming any form of long-term coalition. <laughs> okay, okay. I, I, Full disclosure. I hang out with people I like. That's how I decide. And then if I don't like them, I just don't hang out with them anymore. <laughs> Those are my long-term coalitions. I have long-term coalitions, to be fair. There's people that I've liked for many years now. Um, mm. And I... Uh, no, I don't think those forms of long-term coalition really work either, if that's what you're asking. 
Um, not for me anyway. I was looking um, at scale. I was asking about scale. So I'm a wild woman. You can't keep me down. Um, <laughs> you ain't, you ain't going to touch that Kool-Aid. It just doesn't work for me. It just doesn't work. I just we'll see. You're it. still young. I need to be still, free. Yeah. Okay. I know. So. I have so, like many more decades. I have many more boyfriends uh, to oh, leave. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> in, terms of, <laughs> in terms of, I mean, political coalitions, I think yeah. like, How do you it's form just, it's so a hard to work political... with people. So yeah. you work and you well, just Well, if the UN the is issue. able to, Basically, if there is like... You, do the you take an issue, you yeah. focus on the issue, yeah. and then you break. Like you can't, well, the... you can't agree on everything. You can't expect okay. everybody. You, you have to agree on the things that you're working on. I think this is sort of my view. I don't know what Kay thinks okay. about this. Well, just, just to interject, and I do want to hear Kay's uh, point of view. Um, if the UN can m make marching orders for every NGO and every corporation, then that's showing that it's possible to have a unified conglomerate organization. And if all of the people... If you say like if if the only but they one don't know what they're on to... board with the foot soldiers like Kay says they don't know what they're doing they're too stupid I'm sorry they're stupid these people are okay. not smart people they think they're smart people they don't know what they're doing yeah. you know they don't know right. what the the big plan is here they're just going along because they're told they have to go along or they're told this is what good people do this is what their friends are doing okay yeah. They have righteous indignation. They think they're doing the right thing. They're completely, they've been like activated into some, like they think that this is like the 1940s all over again. And now's their chance to show that they wouldn't have let the Nazis come to power. Like I'll prove it. See, like I'll make these bitches shut up. By putting the Nazis in power <laughs> and ratting out their neighbors hiding. Well, how do we board. formulate a stable coalition that can go the distance against something as entrenched as the UN, as the federal mm -hmm. government? I mean, this is a serious question and it's not just about the gender issue. It's about mm -hmm. a number of different issues, but I think that the gender yeah. issue is showing a way for a lot of people like the trucker protests, like, or, or the convoy or whatever, like the gender issue is one place where I see that it's activating a lot of people across political boundaries mm -hmm. to stop the state from taking over children. So there, I mean, there's one something thing about going the freedom people is that they do yeah. see the bigger picture, right? And so I think that those people do kind of, they're, they're really new to the gender identity issue, um, but they, I think they get that it's part of a bigger plan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's really what's key here, right? We need to educate people and get them to understand that this is coming top down, not top down from Biden's administration or the Trump administration. Yeah. It says above all of that nonsense. Yeah. Those people have people that they answer to. Right. So we really, one of my concerns has always been with this issue from the beginning. I knew it was going to be used as a partisan, that they were going to use this to push left right um, divide. Right, that they were going to make one side the left and make one side the right. That was obvious that that was coming. Um, and now I feel like that's being done even more um, now, right mm -hmm. in front of us. Uh, the more attention that this issue gets, the more it gets funneled into this left right thing. Um, and you is have. Is that their only have, method of controlling the conversation? Is to. It's not the only one, but I think it, yeah. it seems to be extremely effective. Effective, okay. It's so scary how effective it is, actually, because it's so it's such a simple control mechanism that they have going yeah. there. But it does seem to work, <laughs> coupled with you know com total information control, which is what they have: total information control and propaganda um, being shoved down our throats twenty four seven. And now it's institutionalized. It's in the schools, um, and it's it's not new that it's in the schools, right? Parents are finally standing up now. Like I was so proud to see the Canadian families and parents standing up during the one million person march. Um, but this, it's not new that this is happening. Like back in 2011, when I worked at the LGBT nonprofit, we were going into the schools then. And like I said, that's when Soji first got introduced at, at the UN. So it was already happening over 10 years ago. It's just now gotten so bad and reached a certain level of awareness that people are like, oh, maybe this isn't such a good thing. 
Um, but people have been screaming their heads off trying to alar yeah. alert and yeah. alarm the public to this for a very long time and not getting, you know, not being heard or not getting the due, their voice hasn't been given the due diligence to, to really hear what they're saying. Like, well, are like you, Megan, are you downtrodden by that? Or I mean, negatively affected by that? Or do you, do you still have uh, optimistic hope and how do you maintain optimism? I mean, I, you know, I'm pretty <laughs> bummed out and exhausted <laughs> from all the BS that's gone on, but yeah. uh, I don't feel in any way deterred from continuing. Like, I know I'll never stop talking about this. Um, it, it's what I know and the depths of what they've done to children, what they're doing and what they want to do to children, to the human race. Like it's, I'm never going to stop talking about this. If we do, we might as well lay down and die, lay down and take it, you know? Um, so I don't feel like all boo hoo about it, even though like it is so daunting. Right. But I kind of think like they've messed up a little bit. They've pushed a little bit too hard, a little bit too fast. And in the pieces are, everything's kind of starting to unravel. And, and I think the more we keep the focus on the United Nations, not the WEF, the WEF is important too, like they suck, but also, again, the WEF is like, they're a nonprofit. The UN is, is who has the actual power, right? The WEF is mostly like a think tank. Yeah, they're doing a lot of dirty deals and stuff, but we have to look at who controls the power and who controls the UN is largely the United States government as well. So you know, when we're all in these left, right fighting, we have to realize that that's exactly what they want for us. So if we keep on making the trans and the gender identity issue into a left, right thing, we're just feeding right back into that loop. That's exactly what they want from us. So, so recognizing that the entire global power structure has changed, like we're not operating in the same world that we were 10, 15, 20 years ago. The, this is a complete restructuring of the global economy. That's what's happening right now. Mm -hmm. um, corporate power has completely taken over control. Like we don't have like looking at the left and right and thinking that that's who's like w either one of those is going to solve the problems is so stupid to me. Um, especially when I'm looking ahead, right? I'm, my concern is not just about the trans issue, but the trans opens the door. Transgender opens the door for transhumanism. Once they've completely broken down the boundary between the sexes, which is what they're trying to do, that's what the UN's doing, erasing sex as a measurable category in language and law on a global scale. Once they do that, the language is already there. I've read through so many UN documents. The language is there. This the next step is transhuman rights. Okay, the tr the trans rights activists even say that it's on their signs all the time. Transhuman rights, and it's in the UN's um, document. What's what's so bad about transhumanism? I don't want it. I and I ask that because I don't want it to just become a boogeyman. Like, what what do you mean mm -hmm. by that? And why why would it be wrong to like implant a chip into your head? Uh, like have super hearing, or like if you want like a, a third thumb, wouldn't that be awesome? You know. Well, that's not what it's about. Sure, that's part of how it's sold, right? Is like, oh, biohacking, and you can modify your body, and it's just like tattoos, and like, it's just like, you know, piercings, and tribal people have had piercings all this time. Like, we're just modifying our bodies with technology. That's not what this is about. This is about putting all of us, and again, this goes back to the sustainable development goals. This is about getting the entire global population uh, um, into a surveillance system, a surveillance system that starts inside our bodies. They're not just going to be watching from the outside. This is an inside out surveillance that they want to establish. This is a digital identification for all people all across the world. That's what this is about which regulates your movement which re regulates your consumption which uh, just regulates everything everything where you can go when you can go what you can do hmm. so and this is very dangerous and these people talk about racism and white supremacy meanwhile the tools for like complete like you know hitlerian eugenics and beyond are being amassed right now by the global technocratic elite and that's what's happening. 
So it, to me, it's just like, we have to stop. We're on this super low level, just like fighting back and forth. Eh, your side sucks. No, your side sucks. This is so embarrassing to me. It's, huh. it's scary. <laughs> the MAGA so threat, like, shut up, shut up. <laughs> It's really um, not the conservative party will die. People are so stupid and naive. Hmm. Sorry, people. No one listening, clearly. All the well, other people. Kay Yang, <laughs> you brought up that, uh, you know, I have to go control. soon. How long are we? Yeah, yeah, go? This, I'm really that's what I'm, I'm, that's, I'm, I'm, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm ending it right now. So Kay Yang <laughs> okay, brought sorry. up, um, no, no, absolutely. Leave Kay me Yang alone, brought up, okay. Uh, they control all information. So they don't control all information because you guys are both still around. So how can people get informed via your channels? Like, where can they find you? Yeah, because you know, um, we have our top social credit scores going on. You know that we're probably like negative a gazillion on our soft social credit. <laughs> yeah, I'm racking it up. We're racking Thank it God down. I live in Mexico. I, <laughs> right now, I'm trying to focus my energy on Substack because they're a real free speech platform. You have control mm -hmm. over your subscribers, you can take that list with you. Um, people can, you know, contribute directly to the work that they want to contribute to. They don't censor anybody. They're not shadow banning people, which happens on every single other platform. I'm yeah. shadow banned on YouTube. So I've sort of, I've stopped putting my full length videos up there because they demonetize everything I put up no matter what it is. Mm. I'm completely shadow banned on Facebook. No one sees anything that I post there. They are, they mess around with me on Instagram too. Um, I think I'm being messed around with on Twitter. I'm still not allowed to have a subscribe button for no apparent reason. Mm. Um, none of these platforms are dependable. I mean, people talk about social media as, I mean, social media, is great in some ways like i'm independent i'm able to operate independently but that means that i'm relying on these platforms are helpful to me in a lot of ways but i'm also relying on whether or not they'll help me or not because i can be banned in a second you know like they still control who sees what um mm -hmm. but yeah a substack my substack is under www.meganmurphy.ca so that's where um you can follow my podcast and my writing and yeah you can you can really speak freely there so that's what i'm into primarily right now okay i am at www.stopfemaleerasure.com where i've got a lot of info up there um resources for people you can see um, interviews that i've done stuff like that links to other important work um, also on the deprogrammer.com mm -hmm. that also has all my um, old videos that got banned off of YouTube for hate speech before this issue was, um, you know, took center stage the way it has now when there was like not as many people talking about this issue. Um, so I've got banned content on the deprogrammer.com. I'm on stopfemaleerasure.com. I'm on Instagram at the deprogrammer XX. And I'm on Twitter at Stop XX Erasure. Um, and then, yeah, that's right now. Um, I'm really concerned about talking about the United Nations. Actually, Ben, I think it would be great if we could do another chat specifically about that. I can't remember the name of your guest from the other Jason night. Jason Bradley. That'd be great. Yeah, so yeah, I started listening to some of yeah. that and I found myself yeah, yeah. getting frustrated with some of the things he was saying. Oh, great. Oh, good. So I was like, oh, this could be good uh, for another conversation because Great. that has been my focus is talking about um, the UN. And actually, when we were, you can't really see it, but the sign behind me is the one that um, I was holding when we were in San Francisco when they came up and attacked us on the bridge. My sign, it just says United Nations gender identity, the big lie. And that's a reference to Josef Goebbels, the minister of propaganda for Adolf Hitler, when he said, if you tell a lie big enough and keep repeating it, people will eventually come to believe it as the truth. Um, and that's exactly what they've done with gender identity and this idea that anybody has a so-called gender identity or that men can become females or vice versa. So, um, 
you know, in my view, these people who call themselves Antifa and run around masquerading as anti-fascist, they are actually the fascists. They are promoting fascist ideals and they are using violence to um, silence and silence women, intimidate us, harass us, scare women out of speaking. But it's it's not working. <laughs> it's not working. They're making themselves look really bad and unhinged because they are. So... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, they aren't doing themselves any any favors. And I mean, their strategies are successful. Like our, our upcoming event in Nanaimo on October 1st, which is sold out now, actually, although we're doing a wait list, um, <clears throat> which hmm. I'll try to post on my sub stack. Wait, nine, Nina? What's up. this state called? Nanaimo? Nanaimo, Manomo. Nanaimo. <laughs> Where is that? It's in? on Vancouver Island. Okay, Nanaimo. Near Victoria. We lost our venue because... The venue owner got freaked out. This happens almost every time we do any event. People pull out because they're afraid of being threatened, harassed. They're afraid of property damage. They're afraid that their business will be destroyed because these activists do all these things. We do have a new venue, though, so not to worry. But, yeah, I mean, their strategies are successful, but the whole world is seeing what they're up. It's impossible to accuse us of hate when you can see right in front of you who's actually being hateful, right? Fuck your and age. not only that, but if I could just on a last thing is that we have so many detransitioners and de sisters coming forward now, mm -hmm. and there are going to be hundreds, thousands of more. They're going to be coming in waves and droves, yeah. um, and their stories completely shatter the the narrative. And I want to give just a shout out to Elizabeth Chesick and Anna Dutton, who um, are two young sisters who both identified as trans. I did a panel with them um, at the WDI, at the Women's Declaration International Conference in San Francisco. The two of them shared their stories. Anna is only 17 years old. She's already gone through the process of going into a trans identity, um, mm -hmm. being groomed into it by adults online. And now she's like speaking out against these bullying tactics, but also blackmail and manipulation that's being used against these young girls to silence them after they say, wait, I'm not trans. I never was. What is this? So, you know, this is who we have on our side. We have so many young people coming forward, throwing a wrench in the narrative. And there's going to be a lot of people, I think, in the near future with their tail kind of between their legs, not knowing what they should do when they realize that they have pushed for, you know, child abuse, sterilization, eugenics, fascism. <laughs> you know, I think that's already happening now. These people are too cowardly to stand up and say that they did the wrong thing. And that's part of why I've come forward as well, because I want people to stand up. It, it's okay that we were wrong. I was wrong. And someone's asked that in the comments, like, oh, has she admitted what she's done? Yes, many yes, times. I'm speaking about this everywhere. That's why I'm, it's part of why I'm speaking about it. I think we need people to come forward and say, wait a second, I had the wrong idea. I was misled. And, yeah. and we need to right those wrongs because kids are in serious danger. Um, so anyway, as well as yeah, the human race. Well. Yeah, exactly. Well, but you're both I, heroes. I really am, Thank you Megan very much for your evening. Vancouver, yeah. Megan standing up in Vancouver in front of that massive mob of people. Um, to she stand up to defend children. No, I don't. It's terrifying. You love it. Come on. You <laughs> oh, love I it. I hate it. No, it's I hate thrilling. it. I, I honest to God did not like doing that. I do it because I have to and somebody has to and nobody else will. Exactly. Somebody <laughs> has to do it and she did do it. If people think this is like, easy or that it's fun or that we do it because we like it. I mean, I like, I'm a writer. I want to spend all my time writing. I don't want to be out hmm. there yeah, I actually don't talking to, do to people who are trying all. to murder me. Like, hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I just want to go to the trans, pool I never heard of trans like I really wish I never even heard of this oh. that it was never a thing I I, I don't want to have to spend my life doing any of this but I do find it extremely important and I am really grateful for all the people that stood up in Canada and I would like to see something similar happen in the US I know there are different groups trying to organize something like that Mm -hmm. um i support it you know and we've got to speak up now because it's really almost it's getting to be too late the the time is nigh <laughs> speaking of time and nigh thank you very much for joining and thank you very much chat for uh following us along i'm gonna end the stream thanks for having me good to see you both see you soon thanks everyone for coming Ta -ta. bye
Ah, 